we are beginning a new series called DNA. DNA is the stuff that tells your body how to act and everything about you. And we're looking at, at the DNA of the church, of our church, Holly Grove Baptist Church. In 2003, Adam Sandler started a movie with Jack Nicholson titled Anger Management. The movie followed the life of Sandler's character, Dave Busnick, who is a mild-mannered pet clothing designer. Listen, I believe people who put clothes on their pets. Sorry, Christy Brown. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, he was a pet clothing designer who had real self-esteem issues, so much so that he wouldn't even propose to his longtime girlfriend. And so the beginning of the movie, kind of the thing that gets the movie going, is that Dave Busnick is on a flight with a cranky flight attendant who humorously and wrongly accuses him of assaulting her, which lands him in anger management. In his first anger management group session with Jack Nicholson's character, Buddy Rydell, Busnick finds himself in a very, well, eclectic group of troubled folks. Anyways, the session goes on and Dr. Rydell asks Sandler's character to tell us, who are you, Dave? To which Busnick responds by telling him that, hey, you know, I work at this pet clothing store and this is what I do. And Rydell says, no, 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 Dave, I don't want to know what you do for a living. I Just tell me who you are. Again, Busnick starts saying, well, I try to be a good person. I try not to be too angry. And which point Dr. Rydell chuckles and says, Dave, you're describing yourself. I just want to know who you are. You can imagine the frustration that a person might have with that. And he keeps telling him who you are. And he says, you're telling me the wrong stuff. And anyways, the movie goes on with its hijinks from there. But it's that last little bit I want to focus on just a little bit, because who are you is an important question that all people, all entities should ask themselves some point in their existence, isn't it? The philosophical maxim, know thyself, dates all the way back to the Greek philosopher Heraclitus in 500 B.C., 100 years later, an alteration of this would be applied to a, a myth about Prometheus who stole fire from the gods to give to mankind and ultimately was punished because he didn't know himself. He didn't know his limits. He didn't know himself, know his limits. Of course, this philosophical idea would be brought full circle with the great philosopher Dirty Harry Callahan in Magnum Force when he tells the bad cop that he recently dispatched, a man's got to know his limitations. It's a terrible Clint Eastwood impression, but there it is. Christianity, as informed by the Bible, comes at this topic a little bit differently, though. Instead of the stoic introspection, as Christians, we come to the conclusion of who are we from the lens of the Bible. The Bible tells us who we are, why we were created. It tells us our faults, and it tells us who we are in Christ. It's not to say that introspection is wrong or worthless, but it, or that it shouldn't be done, and that's what we're doing uh, this DNA series. Now, this series will be a little bit different from what I typically do, especially this morning. It's not quite a sermon, rather an introduction as to why we're talking about these things, but I hope it'll serve us well. Over the course of the next several weeks, we'll be looking at who we are as a church. We'll be looking at who is Holly Grove Baptist Church? Why are we here? What do we exist for? All those good questions we should be asking. So with that introduction, if you have a Bible today, and I hope you do, I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. I'm actually going to start in Proverbs, but I'll immediately flip over to Matthew. And what we're talking about today, this morning's sermon in a sentence is this. Having a vision for the future is vital if we're going to make an impact for Christ's kingdom. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. But first, I'm going to read Proverbs 29, 18 in the, in the good old King James. And as you're turning there, 
I invite you to stand if you're able in honor of reading God's holy word. This is the word of the Lord. Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Matthew 28, 16. This is the Great Commission. The, ele- the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped. But some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we praise you, for you have a plan. For you are the all good God who has directed everything, even to us to this moment. So Lord, as we come together in this new year and this new season, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to realize who we are as a church, what we're about, so that we might bring all glory to King Jesus, for he is worthy of it all. Help us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. In 1913, an electrician named William was set on developing something that would keep his coffee hot all day. After applying some of his research about electrical theory, specifically the concept of all steel double walled vacuum bottles used in transformers, he succeeded. He then put his family name on this bottle. His family name was Stanley. And his company was largely successful. In fact, it wouldn't be until 2007 that they would even make a different product other than the classic green thermos most of us are familiar with. However, in 2016, they did come up with a new product, the Stanley Quencher. You're already chuckling that people are lining ridiculously out the doors for. But it may surprise you to know that that product was not initially successful. You see, for over a hundred years, Stanley had one demographic they marketed to. The blue-collar working man. You know this. Probably some of you or maybe some of your dads or granddaddies had that Stanley thermos. And it still works. But men weren't buying the Stanley quencher. So what did Stanley do, the company Stanley do? They bought on Terrence Riley. Now, that name means nothing to you, but here's his history. He turned the ugliest shoe in the world. What's the ugliest shoe in the world? Crocs. He turned Crocs into a fashion staple. And when he saw the Stanley quencher... He saw an opportunity. He had a vision for it. He used the same vision and strategy for the Crocs and applied it to that cup. He got TikTokers and Instagram influencers and all those horrible people. They're not actually horrible. They're creating the image of God and Jesus loves them. Uh, To use the product to gain mainstream appeal specifically among women. I don't need to tell you that the strategy worked. But to give you an idea to what degree it worked, in 2019, Stanley had an annual revenue of $75 million. Not too shabby. But in 2023, after they brought on Terrence Riley and his new strategy, their annual revenue was $750 million. You see... Stanley had a great product. Of course, I mean the classic thermos, but but I mean specifically the quencher, that that cup that people are just, I don't understand it. We can argue that it's expensive. We can argue that you can get the same product for a much cheaper price at Walmart, whatever. But the truth is, it is a good product. It keeps your ice, ice and your hot beverages hot or whatever. But Stanley had no vision to get it out to the masses. That's why they needed Terrence Riley. And that's what I want to talk about first. Why a mission and vision? 
There was a time in this country, there was a time in this region, where we just assumed people would go to church. If you wanted to be seen as respected, an upstanding member of the community, you went to church. Now, that doesn't mean you necessarily had a relationship with Jesus, that you were a Christian. It didn't even necessarily mean that you were a good moral person, but it was a community expectation that you went, and so you went. You don't need to tell me, and I don't need to tell you, that that is not the case anymore. More and more people are seeing the church as unnecessary, unimportant, or outdated. And it's not just my generation and younger. It's everyone. So that means for you and for I, folks who are members of the church, people who believe in Jesus, who are members of the gospel community known as Holly Grove Baptist Church, we can't just assume that because we sit here on the corner of Dr. Hess and Poplar Corner that folks will come. We got great new banners. I love them. We're going to talk more about them in a minute. In a minute. But we can't just assume because we put up flags that people are going to come. Well, we have a building. They live close by. Certainly, they'll make their way over here sooner or later. No, there was a day where that may have been the case, but it is certainly not the case anymore. So what do we do? We must have a vision. And I don't mean a supernatural vision where you see a light and, and, you know, someone speaks to you. No, Uh, I mean a path forward, a Holy Spirit-dependent strategy to progress. Something that reminds us of what we're about, or more specifically, who we're about. Now, to a certain extent, we know what we're about, and it's the same that every gospel-believing church ought to be about, and that is the Great Commission. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But how do we do that? You see, Stanley never stopped what they were about, making great double-walled, vacuum-sealed drink containers. We could say that was their mission. But how they got those bottles, those cups, into the hands of the customers, that's what required retooling, re-understanding. Why do we need a mission and a vision? Because as even the Bible Belt becomes progressively apathetic, they don't care, or even antagonistic, they actually hate, towards the things of God, We must remind ourselves what we're about so that we can go and tell them. Where there is no vision, the people perish. We can't just do what we've always done and assume things will always stay the same. As a matter of fact, the only constant in life, apart from the Lord Jesus, is that things will change. That's That's how it works in this world. We must define what we're about so that we may be most effective for the kingdom. So what are we about? That's the next logical question, right? Let me begin with an illustration. The Iowa Hawkeyes football team were the West Division champions for the Big Ten Conference. Not too shabby. It's been far longer than I care to admit since Tennessee was a division champ. But what was noteworthy is how they became the Western Conference Big Ten champions. You see, Iowa's average points per game was an abysmal 15.4 points, just over two touchdowns. That's terrible. And yet, they were the Big Ten Western Conference champions. So how in the world did they get there? Well, as terrible as their points per game was, their opponents points per game was was worse at 14.7 points per game. Iowa averaged just over two touchdowns. Their opponents averaged right at two touchdowns. Now, you might say the mission of the Iowa Hawkeyes football team was to outscore the opponent. That's how football works. You try to score more points. But their coach, Kirk Ferentz's vision was to have a hard-nosed defense. Well, except when you play Tennessee in the Citrus Bowl, who dominates you 35 to 0. Just just throwing that out there. But hopefully that illustration helps you begin to understand mission and vision. So what is Holly Grove's mission and vision? Well, let's talk about that. 
first. What is the mission of Holly Grove? Well, as I said earlier, our mission is mostly the same or should be the same as every other evangelical Bible-believing church. Of, and that is some kind of variation or understanding of the Great Commission. Here's the Great Commission again. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's the Great Commission. This is what churches ought to be about. It's what Brownsville Baptist is about. Here's their mission statement. Put up there on the screen for you. Brownsville Baptist Church is a family of disciples of Jesus Christ in West Tennessee, bonded by grace and commissioned by love to see the kingdom of God advance through the power of the Holy Spirit to the ends of the earth for the glory of God alone. That's Great commission E, if I can say that. That's Great commission E. Here's Zion Baptist Church's uh, mission. We are a growing community of believers that seeks to proclaim God's word to the Brownsville area and ultimately the world. <clears throat> now, why do I share other churches' mission statements? Well, I shared to say if a church believes the Bible and they take the Great Commission seriously, that's that, and, want, and they want to state what they're about, why they exist, it's going to sound familiar. So, so here's ours. The mission of Holly Grove Baptist Church is to share the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ by generously loving others here in Haywood County, West Tennessee, and around the world. It's a little different, but not much. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel here at Holly Grove. We are about the Great Commission. So our mission isn't going to be too different from other churches. And why is that? Because mission is the game, folks. Mission is the game of football. Both Tennessee and Iowa had the same mission, to score more points than the other team. If the mission were different for one of those teams, the game would be, well, it'd be weird. You couldn't even play the game. So Iowa is going to be about scoring points. And Tennessee is going to see how many, how many times they can run around the Iowa defense. I don't know. That would look very weird. That would not be the point. That would be a different game. But we see this in churches, don't we? We see them lose the mission, stop being about the gospel, and they become something else. They become social activism groups. They become spiritual country clubs. They become self-help groups. When churches lose the mission, which is the Great Commission, they lose the primary thing that makes them a church in God's eyes. Sure, they still may call themselves a church, and for all cultural intents and purposes, they may be a church, but they're not, if they're not a gospel church, then how are they even really a Christian church? Earlier, you heard us share about our trip to New York City for a vision trip. Well, we stayed, we stayed not far from the historic Riverside Church of New York City. Most of you are probably not familiar with the Riverside Church of New York City, and that's a good thing because they're historic for what I would say not good reasons. Riverside Church served as ground zero for liberal theology in America. To be sure, liberal theology existed a long time before it existed here, but the Reverend Dr. Harry Emerson Fosdick made it mainstream among Protestants and Baptists. I could say a lot about this, but let me just save time by pointing out what Riverside Church sees as its mission. I couldn't find a mission statement. I put up here for you. The Riverside Church pledges itself to education, reflection, and action for peace and justice and the realization of the vision of the heavenly banquet where all are loved and blessed. Isn't that sweet? Nothing about Jesus, nothing about the gospel, nothing about the Bible, nothing about, nothing about the Great Commission. When you lose the mission, you're playing a different game. The Riverside Church of New York City is playing a different game. Sure, that's swell. It's not Christian, but whatever. Um, so if the mission is the game and the game doesn't change, or at least it shouldn't change, what is the vision? Well, the vision is Iowa's defense. 
vision answers the question of what are we going to do to accomplish the mission. And that's where even, where, where even otherwise similar churches will differ from one another. In fact, as churches move along in their lifespan, the vision may even change. And that's okay because the mission never does. For instance, the church that I was saved and discipled in, uh, when I became a member in 2005, they were passionate about international missions. Half the church's budget went out the door to international missions, either supporting missionaries or sending people on mission trips. Absolutely incredible. Global missions was the vehicle by which they discipled the church. Well, several years later, they opened a school, and the school became the primary, not the only, but the primary ministry of the church. Nothing wrong with that. Still about the Great Commission, but the vision changed. So what is our vision? Well, here it is. Holly Grove's vision is to be a community where disciple-making is prioritized as the means by which the mission of Jesus, loving others and sharing his gospel, is lived out every day. Here at Holly Grove in 2024, you're going to hear a lot about disciple-making, about each one of you, each one of you becoming a disciple who makes disciples. One of the most important verses to me in the Bible is 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Paul is nearing the end of his life, and so he's giving Timothy his last words. And here's what he says in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. How many generations of disciples do you see there? It's four. Four generations of disciples. Paul to Timothy, Timothy to faithful men, and faithful men who will teach others also. My vision, the, the leadership of this church, is the, 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 the vision is that we would become, Holly Grove would become a disciple factory that just cranks out mature church servants. Some who stay and grow in this church, some who are called to missions, some are called to the pastorate, some are called to be church planners, just, just raising up mature believers that go out and spread the gospel and participate in the Great Commission. That's how we'll accomplish the mission here. And we need everyone on board. But simply having a vision is not enough. There has to be a means by which you intend to accomplish that vision. The coach of the Hawkeyes can't just say, well, today, today team, we're going to have a strong defense. And then it just happens. No, that's not how it works. You have to strategy. You have to emphasize certain skills over others. He has to develop talents in, his, in certain players. And so the answer to the question, how do we live out the mission and the vision, is through our values. The tenets we're going to emphasize as a church. Now, the interesting thing about values is some of them are like mission. They are informed from the Bible. But some of them are things that naturally occur within the church body. We'll talk more about this in the coming weeks. But see if you can tell which ones are which as we work our way through the values of Holly Grove. So this is, these are the values of Holly Grove Baptist Church, Bible-centered. We're going to be a Bible-centered church. So largely, the church has been that. We're going to be prayer-fueled. We're going to be an others-embracing church. We're going to be a generous-hearted church. And then we're going to be a mission-focused church. These are the expressions that are put on the flags outside as you might see them as you came. You might have seen them as you came in or as you leave. These are the five core values at Holly Grove Baptist Church. This is what we're about. If you ever wonder or you want to tell someone else, what are, what are you about at Holly Grove? We're, we're a Bible-centered, prayer-fueled, others-embracing, generous-hearted, mission-focused church. Everything we do will come back to these five values. This is our DNA. A few final thoughts. I know this hasn't been a typical sermon. As I mentioned earlier, it's more introspective. But I hope that you walk away understanding that it's worthwhile to consider who we are and what we're called to be as a church. And as we go forward, we'll see that we are indeed called to be what we are indeed called to be is informed by the Bible. Of course, in order to be part of this community, you must be a disciple. You must have faith in Jesus. And so that's the invitation this morning. If, you've, if, you, if you say, hey, Chris, this is what I want to be a part of this. My first question to you is, are, are you a disciple? 
Are you a believer? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, his finished work on the cross and his resurrection? That would be the first step to doing that today. If you've not trusted him, you must do that. Maybe you're currently without a church home, and, and we're thinking seriously about what it means to be a church community right now, as you can tell. Think about who we are, and we would invite you, if you, if you are trusted Jesus and you're not without a church home, we, we'd invite you to come join us, to be part of what we're going to be, what we are called to be. Maybe 2024 is the first time that you take being a church member seriously through service, through your life. Make that commitment today to say, I want to I wanna serve. I want to serve in a capacity, in a higher level than I've ever served before. Or maybe you want to serve for the very first time. We invite you to do that. You can, you can talk to one of the pastors about that. You come down here, talk to me about that. Make that commitment today. But I'm going to pray for us and ask the Lord to bless our vision going forward, that we would be a disciple-making community that would raise up on-fire disciples ready to go out and spread the Great Commission, be part of the Great Commission. Will you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, for what you're doing, what you're doing here at Holly Grove Baptist Church. Lord, we ask that you would help us to be indeed what you've called us to be. That is a Great Commission church, a a mission-focused church that wants to see people saved, that see, wants to see people baptized and set on the road to discipleship, Lord. We pray that you would make us a, uh, remind us of what we're called to be as a Bible-centered church, that the Bible would always be first and foremost here. Lord, I pray that you would make us a praying church, recognize that we can't do anything, we don't want to do anything apart from the Holy Spirit empowering us, and we would pray to that end. Lord, that we would be an others-embracing church. That is, people that, that are looking for a home, that are looking to be part of a community, that they would be, find love and hope here through the gospel of Jesus and through his saints here at Holly Grove. We a generous-hearted church. That would be a church that gives to others, that gives to the Great Commission. I thank you for the overwhelming uh, adoption of the Great Commission offering, Lord, that we already see that manifested. And that we would indeed keep mission, keep the main thing, the main thing, and that is the gospel. We thank you for that, Lord. I pray for anyone here that just doesn't know you, that you would work in their hearts and they would come to trust Jesus. Lord, I pray for anyone here that has maybe been sitting on the sidelines and wants to get in the game of ministry and service, that you would move them wherever they need to be. Lord, we ask that you would have your way among us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand?